Hi, everyone, this is the Encyclopedia Channel. The book that this program interprets for you is damn right. Behind the scenes with Berkshire Hathaway billionaire Charlie Munger, and the essence of this book is, a person who is smarter than Buffett, the legendary life of investment master Charlie Munger, and understand Charlie Munger's personal experience about life and career. The author is the famous best-selling female author Janet Lowe, who also wrote Benjamin Graham Talks About Value Investing, Warren Buffett Says and so on. At the same time, she is also a well-known financial reporter in the United States, with hundreds of articles published in Newsweek, Los Angeles Times and other media. Charlie Munger is a financial tycoon, known as the behind-the-scenes think tank of Warren Buffett, and a life partner who is as intelligent as Buffett. Unlike Buffett, Munger is very low-key, he doesn't care whether he is in the spotlight or not. Buffett's eldest son once said, My dad is the second smartest person I know, and Charlie Munger is the first. Buffett himself once said that it was Charlie Munger who made him evolve from an orangutan to a human being, otherwise he would be much poorer than he is now. Charlie Munger is arguably the preeminent thinker in the investing industry today, but he wasn't born that way. What kind of life path has he experienced, and what wealth insight does he have that allow him to have such achievements? As an ordinary person, what inspiration can we get from Munger's experience, how to learn how to invest in our own life, and make our life more in line with what we want? That's what we're going to talk about in this episode. We will share with you the legendary life of Charlie Munger from three aspects. First, Charlie Munger's life experience of never giving up lightly. Second, how he earned his first million. Third, how he and Buffett built a financial empire. First part. Charlie Munger's Life Story of Never Giving Up Born in 1924, Munger had a complicated life experience. Before he was 30 years old, he experienced at least three twists and turns. The first twists and turns that Munger experienced was when he was six years old. At that time, the United States encountered the worst economic depression in history. Starting from Black Friday on October 29, 1929, the total market value of the stock market fell by 40% in one month. I've never had $100,000. At that time, people's life was generally very difficult. In order to supplement the family, one summer, Munger's family tried their best to find him a summer job at 40 cents an hour. However, fortunately, Munger's father was a lawyer at the time and unexpectedly obtained a large sum of income in a lawsuit, which allowed the life of Munger's family to be maintained. However, despite this, Munger still needs to use his spare time to work and make money as much as possible. He once worked in a grocery store in the town. What's interesting is that this grocery store was opened by Buffett's grandfather. Munger and Buffett are actually fellow villagers, but he is six years older than Buffett, so the two did not meet at that time. The days of working in the grocery store were very difficult. Munger later called it service time every Saturday. He had to work non-stop for 12 hours in order to get paid $2 a day, and he had to give Buffett's grandfather two cents to pay his own social security. However, this early difficult experience also provided Munger with a valuable introductory education in business. That being said, after working for a while, Munger still managed to find a way to change jobs. The second twists and turns in Munger's life came when he was just admitted to university. In 1941, at the age of 17, Munger left his hometown to study at Michigan State University. Soon the Pearl Harbor incident that shocked the world broke out, and the United States entered the Second World War. This war caused many young people to drop out of school and enlist in the army, and Munger, who was just a sophomore, was not spared. When he first joined the army, Munger's situation was not good. He was placed in a tent in the harsh environment of Utah's ice and snow. However, it was this difficult environment that made Munger enthusiastic about changing his life. He told his friends that he wanted to have a bunch of children, build a house with a lot of books in the house, and have enough wealth to live a free life. If Munger was assigned to the army to fight on the front line at that time, the world might have one less investment master. Fortunately, he was assigned to the Air Force and did not need to fly an airplane to fight. Instead, he was a weather forecaster for logistic support which allowed Munger to stay away from the battlefield. And because of this, he was arranged to go to different schools to participate in training to supplement the knowledge of meteorology, physics, and mathematics needed to become a weather forecaster. 
It is worth mentioning that one of the training sessions was held at Caltech University in Pasadena, California. This experience made him fall in love with this city, and later he chose to settle here. But this is something later. The 21-year-old Munger met his first wife Nancy during his service and soon gave birth to his first son Teddy. Munger loves children very much. With the war over, Munger also retired. He was a young man with only a high school degree and no college degree. Therefore, Munger's family managed to get him into Harvard Law School to continue his studies through the relationship. He was very smart. Among the 335 graduates that year, he was one of only 12 outstanding graduates and successfully obtained a degree from Harvard Law School. Arguably, the 1950s were considered the happiest decade in America. However, what I didn't expect was that Munger's good use was over, and he was about to face the third twists and turns in his life, which was also the darkest period of his life. First, Munger and his first wife divorced in 1953. Not long after their divorce, their nine-year-old son Teddy was diagnosed with leukemia. At that time, leukemia was an incurable and terminal disease. Munger was stunned, and his life was hit hard. His good friend recalled, Munger watched his son lie in the hospital bed and died slowly. He went in and hugged him for a while, and then ran outside and walked along the street crying. Teddy passed away the year after the diagnosis. Munger recalled, I can't imagine any experience in life worse than watching a child die little by little. At the age of 30, at the golden age of a man, Munger has experienced the pain of marriage failure and bereavement. After experiencing these mental blows, Munger became financially impoverished. At that time, because there was no medical insurance, Munger had to pay all the expenses. He had to work hard in a hideously ugly car that had been repainted with cheap paint, and indeed, at this point Munger was nearly broke. For many people, going through something like this can be devastating. But Munger was not overwhelmed by the ensuing suffering and misfortune, as one of Munger's sons, Charles Jr. said, he was able to get rid of these tragedies without hesitation. In fact, Munger has experienced unbearable sufferings for ordinary people. Instead, he has tempered his character, made him cherish life, and always maintain a positive outlook on life. Slowly, he began to walk out of the darkest trough. In 1956, three years after the divorce, Munger married his second wife. Coincidentally, his new wife is also named Nancy. At that time, Charlie Munger and his first wife already had two daughters, and his second wife, Nancy, brought two more children. Charlie Munger loves children, and he and his second wife had three more boys and a girl, which means he has eight children to support. At that time, Munger was a lawyer. In the 1950s, Lawyers were not a particularly lucrative job, and Munger was a lawyer who had just entered the industry not long ago, which made him even more stretched. The second part. Under such huge economic pressure, how did Charlie Munger get out of the predicament and earn his first pot of gold in life? This is what we are going to talk about in the second part, the turning point in Munger's life, earning the first million. Although Munger was very difficult at the time, his style of acting completely followed a truth his grandfather taught him since he was a child. His grandfather said that there are two things to focus on in life, first, you must concentrate on doing what you are doing well, second, save money and invest the saved money in the future. It sounds like such an empty truth, but as Buffett said, the old truth is always correct, the key is whether you can practice it. The turning point in Charlie Munger's life came from his practice of this truth. As a lawyer, he should do his best to serve his clients diligently and with all his strength. Once, when Munger was a junior partner, he took over a case. He knew that the client would come to discuss a plan of action one day if he was in trouble. So he worked overtime in advance and stayed up late, carefully analyzed the case, determined that there were only three possible solutions to the case, and conducted in-depth research on the methods of each solution. As a result, the customer came the next day, and as expected, the customer brought up one of the situations in Munger's preliminary plan. The senior partner asked Munger to go back and prepare the plan, and asked the client to come over tomorrow to continue the discussion. But Munger got up and said, I can come up with the plan now. This shocked the client, but it also won the trust of the client. After that, the client appointed Munger as their attorney. 
it is precisely because of Munger's extremely serious and hard work that he has won the trust of more and more clients. People saw Munger's ability, and also saw Munger's sincerity and integrity, so some people began to be willing to cooperate with him in a wider field. And this opened a window for Munger's investment career. The first person to formally cooperate with Munger outside of his legal work was the owner of an electrical appliance manufacturer. It was around the 1950s, another troubled time, when the United States was fighting the Korean War. During the war, military supplies in the United States were very popular, and this electrical company produced transformers for the Army's rocket launchers, so the sales were very good. The owner of the electrical appliance manufacturer admired Munger very much, so he invited Munger to join the company as a shareholder and let him participate in the operation of the electrical appliance company. Munger was short of money at the time, so he agreed to work part-time. This part-time experience lasted for five or six years. Although he encountered various difficulties during the period, his investment and income after five or six years are still considerable. More importantly, this cooperation has accumulated Munger's first business experience in a real sense and laid the foundation for his subsequent career. After the work in the electrical factory, another client of Munger's law firm invited him to cooperate with him to start a second business. The client is named Booth, and Munger is the same age. In the process of Munger helping him with legal affairs, the two slowly became good friends. How good is it? Both of Booth's wives were introduced by Munger, and the two families often go on vacation together. When Booth's grandfather died, Booth turned to Munger to deal with will-related issues. Among the estates is a vacant lot across the street from USC Tech Booth's father thought the vacant land was useless, so he was going to sell it. At this time, Munger was very keen to think that this vacant land might be valuable. Because Los Angeles in the 1960s was a period of massive population influx, and Pasadena, where Caltech is located, happened to be a satellite city in the suburbs of Los Angeles, so Munger believed that real estate development here was very promising. So he suggested to Booth, you should buy this piece of land from your father, and then tear down the houses on it, rebuild apartments, and engage in real estate development. But Booth said, I have never engaged in real estate development, and I don't understand it at all. If you really think this idea is good, why don't you invest money to do it with me? Without you, I can't do this project. After hearing this, Munger smiled and said, if I can't even implement my own suggestion, wouldn't I be humiliating myself? In this way, they each invested half of the investment and invested a total of 100,000 US dollars to start the development of real estate. As a result, as Munger expected, the real estate development won a big victory. They invested 100,000 yuan and finally got back 500,000 US dollars. After tasting the sweetness, Munger seemed to become a real estate development boss, and then continued to develop the second, third, fourth, and fifth buildings, and these houses sold well. In just three years, Munger accumulated an income of up to 1.4 million US dollars. You have to know, this is not 1.4 million dollar today, but 1.4 million dollars in the 1960s, that is a huge fortune. Speaking of this, you may think that Munger was just lucky to catch up with the crazy era of real estate development, but it is not. In those years, real estate had ups and downs, and many houses were not sold very well. However, as a novice, Munger quickly discovered two key secrets of real estate development at that time. Let's look at the first secret he discovered. After developing the first building, Munger found that the buildings on the ground floor sold very quickly and the rooms on the upper floors sold slowly. Therefore, he judged that people liked to live on the first floor, so he insisted on not building high-rise buildings from the second house. Although the unit price of flat floors with very low density is high, the supply is in short supply every time it is developed, and the sales are very good. The second secret is that he found that at that time many real estate development bosses were unwilling to spend money on greening, and the greening of the community could save money. Munger said that the lush greening is actually a core selling point, and the money invested in trees will bring three times the return, because people always like places that look fresh and green with lush flowers and plants. So Munger actually used his keen analysis and judgment when developing real estate, which made him earn his first one million in real estate part-time in his spare time as a lawyer. But why didn't Munger later become a real estate tycoon? 
There are two reasons for this. First, he found that borrowing is indispensable for real estate development, and he always asks people to borrow money, which he finds particularly troublesome. Second, real estate development is extremely cumbersome, and every detail is important, and this kind of work is difficult to do full-time, let alone part-time. The third part. If Charlie Munger did not continue to do real estate, how did he use his assets of more than 1 million yuan to become a financial tycoon later? This is what we will discuss in part 3. It turned out that during Munger's development of real estate, he also met a person who later had a deep influence on him, and that was Buffett. However, Buffett had taken a liking to Charlie Munger long before the two of them actually met. It turned out that Buffett had a doctor friend named Davis who also knew Munger. One day, Buffett went to Dr. Davis's house to sell securities funds. Although Dr. Davis was impatient to listen to his introduction, he finally agreed to invest, which made Buffett very curious. The answer Davis gave was, you remind me of Charlie Munger. It was such a simple sentence that made Buffett full of affection for Charlie Munger. Dr. Davis thought that Munger was a very unique and intelligent person among his friends, and Buffett was another unique and intelligent person he knew. He felt the need to introduce the two people. So he held a dinner party, inviting both Buffett and his wife, and Charlie Munger and his wife. As a result, Buffett and Charlie Munger hit it off that day, and they hit it off very well. So much so that when Charlie Munger picked up the teacup to pour water, he had to stretch out his other arm to stop others from speaking, so as not to disturb the chat between him and Buffett. During this period, Buffett has been instilling his point of view in Charlie Munger, your intelligence should not be limited to the legal profession, you can fully use your intelligence and intelligence by investing in business. Under Buffett's repeated suggestions, and the funds accumulated by Munger through real estate gave him enough sense of security, Munger finally began to participate in securities investment. But at the beginning, the two were not very formal partners. In Buffett's words, their relationship at that time was when the market is good, they are junior partners, and when the market is not good, they become senior partners. However, the two have always been partners in spirit. They often talk on the phone and even write letters to discuss issues. Sometimes a letter even writes nine pages, which is longer than most letters between lovers. The two of them learn and grow from each other in the communication with each other. However, the cooperation between the two will finally begin, and the business of this investment cooperation is the acquisition of a blue-chip printing company. The acquisition of blue-chip printing not only laid a good foundation for the future cooperation between the two, but also paved the way for the financial empire of the two. What's going on? Blue Chip Printing, the name sounds strange, Blue Chip is the name of the company, and printing is its business. In the United States in the 1950s and 1960s, retail companies such as supermarkets, shopping malls and gas stations liked to use gift certificates for promotion. After people buy things and spend money, they can get corresponding gift certificates. These gift certificates can be exchanged for prizes when they accumulate to a certain amount. If they are less, they can be exchanged for children's toys, knives and forks, stationery, etc. If they are more, they can be exchanged for watches, ovens and other gifts of higher value. At first, these gift certificates were issued by the store itself. Later, this form of promotion became more and more popular, and there were companies that specially issued gift certificates, which can be used in different stores. This is a bit like the current model of redeeming gifts with points. Blue Chip Stamping Company is such a gift certificate issuing company, and it is the largest gift certificate sales company in California. In 1970, the Blue Chip Stamp Company was ordered to sell 55% of the shares by the U.S. Department of Justice for suspected market monopoly. However, many people did not take this news seriously. Because people think that the business of issuing gift certificates is a sunset industry. As American women gradually enter the workplace from full-time housewives, Fewer and fewer people will save gift certificates to exchange for small gifts. But after Charlie Munger and Buffett knew the news, they were keenly aware that this was an important opportunity. Of course, they also saw that the printing business could be depressed, but they also saw a key value that others did not see, and that was the reserve funds behind the blue chip printing companies. What is a reserve fund? For businesses such as shopping malls and supermarkets, in order to promote sales, 
they have to buy a large number of gift coupons from Blue Chip Printing for backup. This brought a large amount of cash to the Blue Chip Stamping Company. Before the gift was exchanged, the money was placed in the reserve account of the Blue Chip Stamping Company. It could be used at will without paying interest. Moreover, it takes a long time for consumers to save enough stamps to exchange for gifts, or someone puts stamps in a drawer and forgets, and never redeems them. These unredeemed gift certificate funds will add up, which will also accumulate a large amount of funds. In 1968, Blue Chip Stamping Company had unredeemed gift certificates worth 60 million US dollars. In 1970, the sales revenue of gift certificates exceeded 1.24 billion, and the unredeemed gift certificates amounted to 12 million. Charlie Munger and Buffett saw great value in this, because it meant that as long as they controlled the company, they would have ample reserves to use as capital to invest in other businesses. Therefore, Charlie Munger and Buffett started the work of acquiring blue chip stamps step by step. In the end, Buffett's investment company was relatively rich and acquired 45% of the shares of blue chip stamping, while Munger's investment company acquired 8% of the shares. When they acquired the blue chip printing company, it happened to be the peak of the blue chip printing business. In that year, the sales of Blue Chip Printing Company was 160 million, but 10 years later, the sales of Blue Chip Printing Company was only 100,000 US dollars, a drop of 99.9%. But when they took over, Blue Chip Stamps had a net worth of 46 million dollars, and 10 years later they invested in various businesses to make Blue Chip Stamps net worth 195 million dollars. This blue chip printing investment has become the first big victory that Buffett and Munger have won in cooperation. Moreover, the mode of this investment has become an important capital operation mode of their company, which is to amplify their investment capabilities by looking for companies with reserve funds. We know that there are actually other companies in the world that have a similar model, such as insurance companies. The insurance company is taking your premium up front, but you may never even redeem it. Berkshire is also one of the largest insurance companies in the world today. They have acquired a large number of insurance companies in the United States. Why? It is to use a model like blue chip stamps to expand and grow capital. That's why they later used the money to invest in Seas Candies, Wesco Financial Corporation, Buffalo News Corporation, which brought them huge profits, and the Berkshire Group that was formed later invested in Coca-Cola, Apple, and other companies. Their original model played a very critical role. Therefore, for Charlie Munger, blue chip printing is an important turning point in his entire investment history, and his ability to keenly discover the real investment value in a business that others are not optimistic about is the key to his success. As of August 2017, one share of Berkshire's stock was as high as $220,000. It is one of the richest and most profitable companies in the world today and it is also a miracle in the history of human investment and finance. Speaking of which, you may think that Munger has become today's financial giant because of his shrewd calculations and business sensitivity. However, it is likely that these reasons are just one side of his answer to success, and not even the most important one. Munger can become a master in the financial field not only because he is smart, but also because he is upright, kind, and full of conscience. In many cases, the equity investment that Munger is engaged in is not simply a matter of clicking a mouse. He needs to personally participate in many specific tasks and establish a tacit understanding and trust with the investee team. If he just calculated shrewdly, he would never be able to win the support of so many people and build this business empire. For example, one year Munger wanted to acquire a company that was started by the founders two ants each with a loan of 80,000 US dollars. Later, the founder passed away, but the company neither gave the two old people any interest nor repaid the arrears. At that time, this IOU was equivalent to a piece of waste paper in the hands of the two old people. In this case, Munger's partners said that even if we buy this IOU at a price of less than 80,000 US dollars, they will definitely be willing. However, Munger did not follow the shrewdness of a businessman to negotiate terms with the two old men but insisted on paying the original price of 80,000 US dollars. Later, after they received the equity of the company, the partner wanted to withdraw his shares and exchange them for cash because the family needed money. Munger said, how much do you want? The partner thought for a while and said, 
$200,000. Munger said, no, you are wrong. The partner regretted in his heart, damn it, I quoted such a high price because I needed $200,000 myself. As a result, Munger said, your share is worth $300,000. Munger went on to say that if you think about it, you will agree with me. Because you're smart and I'm always right. There are countless things like this in Munger's life. For example, when Salomon Bank, which he invested in, was investigated for manipulating bond prices, he immediately stood on the side of the public interest and worked hard to find fairness for public investors, even if it would ruin Salomon Bank's lucrative bond trading business. At the same time, he encouraged the employees of the company to work hard, stick to integrity, and restore credibility. Munger's upright character has won the trust and support of more people, which has made his career bigger and bigger. However, these things mentioned above are also part of his investment career. Munger is indeed very diligent and puts hard work first, but this does not mean that he has no life. You may not imagine that Munger is also a designer. He has the largest private catamaran yacht in the world, and this yacht is designed by himself. At the same time, he is also an excellent architect. He builds the house according to his own preferences, and he participates in the whole process from the initial drawing design to every detail afterwards. For example, all the buildings he donated were designed by himself, including the dormitory building of the Stanford University Graduate School and the Harvard High School Science Museum. Charlie Munger is very rich and has his own private jet, but he always takes the economy class of public airlines when he travels on official business. When someone asked him why he didn't take his own private jet, he replied, first, it was too much fuel for him to fly a private jet alone, he only uses his private jet when he takes his wife and children on vacation, because he believes that his wife has paid for him all her life. Now, let's review the main content of this book. First, as a financial giant, Munger's life has not been smooth sailing. He has experienced a series of difficult moments such as financial crisis, war dropout, divorce, and loss of children. Second, during this process, Munger abided by the traditional spirit of the Western United States, doing things well with diligence and focus, being sincere, honest, and kind to people, and saving money to invest in future things, which won him the trust of many people who were willing to cooperate with him so that he had the opportunity to experience other investment businesses, and finally earned his first million in real estate business. In the end, relying on his keen analysis and thinking, he and Buffett joined forces to acquire businesses such as blue chip stamps and other insurance companies in the United States, and invested in many high-quality companies, and finally built today's Berkshire financial empire step by step. Munger once said, I like reading biographies very much. I think that if you want to teach people some great and useful ideas, biography is an easier way for people to connect the life and personality of the founder of the idea. Now it's the turn of Charlie Munger's own biography to come out. This is the end of this episode of the show. What do you think about it differently? Welcome to leave a message to discuss with everyone. Hey, if you like our channel, please subscribe us. Haha, <laughs> remember to like it.